you very much indeed and thank you for that warm welcome um i'm afraid talks from me involve sharing at, uh, staring at slides so we're just going to switch to me sharing my screen which hopefully you will now all be able to see um, and we will take it from there so basically what i want to do in, in this talk is to give you an idea over the next half an hour or so as to both how and why the issue of Brexit has reshaped the character of support for our two largest parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, um, across uh, Great Britain uh, as a whole. Um, and to do that, um, I'm going to really talk about three things. I need, first of all, to go back and look at the the character of attitudes uh, towards Brexit uh, and the kind of people who were and who were not supporting it um, and how that compares with the character of support before Brexit for both the Conservatives and the Labour Party in particular. Then I will look at what happened to public opinion so far as their attitudes towards Brexit are concerned subsequent uh, to the 2016 referendum um, and to what extent in particular attitudes proved or to be stable or otherwise because clearly if something is going to change potentially the character of the poor political party that thing probably needs to be something that's a reasonably stable stable element of people's attitudes and then I will then finally get to, and it might seem a slightly long journey there, and we'll finally get to, uh, okay, what has now happened to uh, support uh, for political parties in the light of all this? But by that stage, hopefully, you will begin to understand why Brexit has had the electoral impact it's had. But to start the story, I'm going to go back to pre-Brexit days and back to the 2015 general election, not because I'm particularly interested in the general election uh, of its own, but rather as a kind of indicator of what life was like electorally before Brexit. And what I'm doing here is uh, taking an analysis of the electorate in where I'm dividing the electorate uh, into those who are one third most left wing, one third most right wing, and the one third who are in the middle. And the way in which that categorization has been done, it comes from a whole series of questions in the British Social Attitude Survey, in which we ask people questions essentially about, well, you know, how equal or unequal do you think society is, one, and two, what, if anything, do you think the government should do about it? And essentially the argument is that the left-right divide in Britain is primarily a divide about what the role of the state should be, in reducing inequality versus providing the incentives that are required for the kind of economic growth that is needed to improve everybody's uh, welfare. Um, so the, what I'm going to show you for the Conservative Labour Party is not really going to come as to you as a great surprise. Take the 2015 general election, around two thirds of those people who on this criterion we define as being on the right, voted for the Conservative Party in 2015, and in contrast, only 17% of those on the left did. Meanwhile, Labour clearly doing much better amongst those on the left than those on the right. But then look at the other two parties that polled um, a discernible amount in that election, UKIP and the Liberal Democrats. Notice in particular UKIP, which actually in 2015, and obviously this is the precursor of the Brexit vote, actually UKIP was doing as rather better amongst voters who are on the left on my criterion than it was amongst voters on the right. That's your first crucial clue to the story that's going to come. Also notice, by the way, Liberal Democrats not essentially defined by being on the left or on the right, pretty much even across the board. Now, now I'm going to take the same election, but divide people by a different uh, criterion. I'm going to divide people according to whether they are social liberals or social conservatives. By a social liberal, I essentially mean somebody who says, look, at the end of the day, what moral code somebody follows, 
what social mores they adhere to, what symbols they recognize, their sense of identity, national identity, what language they speak, what religion they follow, what moral code they adhere to. These are all things essentially for the individual to decide for themselves. On the other hand, social conservatives say, no, no, hang on, if we're going to have a reasonable degree of cohesion in society, then actually society, for example, does need to impose to some degree at least a common moral code. We do need people speaking the same language. We do, everybody kind of acknowledging the, the, the union flag, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the former group, social liberals, tend to be quite like enjoy living in a multicultural, multi-ethnic environment of which London is of course a prime example. Social conservatives, uh, on the other hand, prefer to live in rather more homogenous environments. Now, this division has always, always been there in British politics, but so far as Conservative and Labour is concerned, as you can see, it's very much a secondary division. So Conservatives do somewhat better among social conservatives than social liberals. Labour, the opposite, but it's nothing like a big, as big a divide as I showed you as the division between left and right in the previous slide. But now look at UKIP and look at Liberal Democrats. On Liberal Democrats, the, the, the um, answer is in the name. Liberal Democrats are defined primarily by the fact that they are social liberals. And yes, UKIP support was defined crucially by the fact that uh, it was social conservatives. That's your second crucial clue about uh, the Brexit and the character of support for it. Let's now redo the same analysis, but for how people voted in the 2016 EU referendum. In this data, other data would just simply say it doesn't make any difference at all. Actually, if anything, people who were on the left were slightly more likely to vote Leave than people on the right. But then given I've shown you the people UKIP supporters are more likely to be on the left, that shouldn't surprise you. And to apply, as people often do, the description uh, that, you know, people who voted Leave are right wing and people who voted Remain are left wing is, I think, a serious mislabeling of what underlay the Brexit vote. Crucially, the Brexit vote cuts across the traditional left-right divide that has historically structured support for Conservative and Labour. So here now you're getting your first really big clue about why Brexit is potentially so disruptive of our traditional party, patterns of electoral support. On the other hand, again, if I take my criterion as social liberals versus social conservatives, lo and behold, we now see the action. Social liberals voted remain, social conservatives voted leave. There are other things about Brexit that, as it were, certainly not part of the common fare traditionally of British politics. It was very much a division by age. 80, relatively few 18 to 24 year olds voted in favor. Majority of people 65 plus certainly did. Second uh, division was by educational background. Relatively few people with university degree voted for Brexit. Um, lots of people with fewer of any educational qualifications did so. Now this of course is you know, age certainly not traditionally a big divide in our politics, although there have been signs of it in 2015. And if, when we talk about you know, other social divisions, we tend to talk about uh, not education, but social class. Well, given the relationship with education, there's a bit of a relationship with social class, but not that much. Yes, people in professional managerial occupations less likely to vote leave. But after that, frankly, there's very little difference between intermediate uh, uh, white collar workers and those in working class jobs. Um, so this is not in line with the traditional demographics of British electoral politics, where the Conservatives are the party of the middle class, Labour the party of the working class. Why should younger people and people with educational qualifications be more likely to vote uh, Brexit? Well, yes, they are more socially liberal, but they also have different real interests in the Brexit debate. Immigration, that central issue in the Brexit debate, is something that younger people with educational qualifications, that means they can find a job in a, in a overseas labor market, do. 
it is something that happens to older people who have less than the way of educational qualifications, um, who um, they may find that their communities change as a result of migration. They themselves do not have the skills and they now have too many familial ties uh, to, to migrate themselves. So there's a real, uh, a real interest division here that's going on behind this demographic division. Now, given all of this, it now should no longer begin to surprise you that for Conservative and Labour, um, both struggled to get their voters to vote with them. And that, of course, David Cameron was trying to persuade people to vote Remain. In the end, uh, by a narrow majority, though Conservative supporters actually voted Leave. Labour Party tried, um, but only got by two to one to vote in favour of Remain. The one exception, yes, of course, you, Kip. Um, I always like this slide. It's the only occasion in 40 years of social science research that I've had a slide in which 100% of a group all do the same thing. There's always somebody who does something slightly different, but not on this occasion. But for other mainstream parties are concerned, Brexit cuts across their traditional bastions of party support. So clearly, potentially disruptive. Okay. Um, but what then about the character of post-Brexit attitudes? And in particular here, what I'm going to talk about is the way in which the labels Remainer and Lever have become part of a, not just our political dictionary, but actually also part of the way in which many people feel about themselves. It's become a sense of identity uh, that and, and a label that uh, people apply to themselves. So let me get to that point. First of all, let's look at what British political science has found uh, and found between 1964 through all the way through to 2017. When people were asked, well, do you think of yourself as a Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat or what? And then went on to ask those who said, named a party in response to that question, are you a very strong Conservative, a fairly strong Labour uh, person, or a not very strong uh, Liberal Democrat? Um, and it's the answer to that second question I'm showing you here. And uh, one of the, you know, the kind of major changes in the British electorate in the second half of the 20th century was a marked decline in the proportion of people who said they were a very strong Conservative or Labour supporter. Back in the 1960s, over 40% of people would have labelled themselves and said, I'm very strong Conservative or Labour. That fell away very strongly in the 1974 election. And by the time we were getting on the eve of Brexit, no more than 15% of people feeling that way. So we're talking about an electorate that doesn't, for the most part, feel particularly strongly committed to any of the political parties. Now look to see what happens when we started asking after the referendum much the same question about being a Remainer or a Lever. So we asked people are you a Remainer or are you a Lever or do you not uh, think of yourself in that way at all and then go on to say if uh, people say Remainer or Lever are you a very strong Remainer or a fairly strong Lever or what. And as you can see we're back to the politics of the 1960s. Over 40% of people say they're a very strong Remainer or a very strong Lever. So all of a sudden, a British electorate, which apparently was emotionally at least relatively disengaged from the political process, has in the wake of Brexit become strongly identified with political options. But those options are not our political parties, they are the uh, options that appeared on the 2016 ballot paper. And so clearly, therefore, with a weak sense of party identity, but a strong Brexit identity, this is perhaps potentially disruptive. Indeed, if we ask the same people as were done on this survey, what they, their attitudes towards their Brexit identity and their attitudes towards their party identity, as you can see, 40% of people no, I really don't feel Conservative or Labour at all, over 40% of people saying they're a very strong Remainer or Lever. So perhaps therefore not surprising that once we start to look through 
the history of how people said they would vote if there'd been another referendum, that not an awful lot changed after 2016. Here, here's the early run of polls, um, basically uh, through to the 2017 general election at least, slightly more people saying they would again vote leave than remain. It turns over thereafter and for all sorts of other reasons, the 2017 election is an important part of the story. Thereafter, um, continuously, blue line here is people who say they vote remain from about 2018 onwards. Uh, the green line is leave. So it, it flips around. We're looking at 52, 53% support for remain, but um, still looking at a very divided um, electorate. Um, again, similarly, um, ask people whether or not in hindsight you think the Brexit right, vote was right or wrong. And again, you can see the 2017 election is a crossover point. Um, but again, you know, yes, we get some movement in the, in the direction of wrong, but we're still looking at an electorate that looks very much divided. And indeed, actually, the turnover in the electorate, i.e. the extent to which people change their mind as compared with 2016, is even less than you might assume from those last few slides I've just shown you. This was the position as of January, the end of well, basically 12 months ago now, when we left the European Union showing you um, in the most recent polls at that point, the proportion of those people who voted Remain in 2016, who said that they would vote Remain again, 88%. The proportion of Leave voters who said they would vote Leave again, 85%. In other words, most people who voted in 2016 are saying, yep, I do exactly the same thing again, maybe slightly softer on the Leave side, but that's it. The reason actually why the polls show, have been show, have showed uh, all the way through the last two or three years of the Brexit process, leave uh, being slightly behind, is that the people who did not vote in 2016, some of whom of course were too young in 2016 to vote, but that's by no means all of them, um, were around two to one in favour of leave. And indeed, insofar as anybody changed their attitudes, that's, this is the group that changed. This is showing you the views of abstainers trapped during the course of the Brexit process years, shortly after the referendum, probably only slightly in favour of Remain, but soon thereafter, around two to one in favour. So actually, insofar as there's been any change of attitude, it was amongst, as it were, that section of people who didn't vote in 2016. So we're essentially looking at a stable electorate that did not change its views about Brexit and which also in many cases felt a really strong commitment to that one or other side of the argument and a much stronger commitment than they had to a political party. Given this, there is clearly potentially a recipe for substantial disruption of the pattern of conservative labor and support, given that the basis of the way in which people voted remain or leave cuts across the traditional patterns of party support. And of course, by the time we got to the 2019 election, the parties found themselves basically in two camps. And therefore the polarization of the electorate was now being reflected in a polarization of the options that were represented by the electorate on an election that was being called in order to resolve the Brexit stalemate that had bedeviled the parliament throughout 2019. The 2017 election was also called supposedly to resolve Brexit, it just uh, failed to do so. But on the one hand, you had the Brexit party and the Conservatives saying we should leave and more or less saying both of them by the time election campaign, we'd get out with the deal that's been negotiated at the end of January, 2020. The Labour Party wanted to renegotiate the deal, but having renegotiated the deal and not necessarily being willing to tell us which side they would back in the wake of that renegotiation, we would hold a second referendum in which the other option would be to remain. So to that extent, at least, they were now in the camp of people who wanted to keep open the possibility that the UK might change its mind. Meanwhile, uh, the SNP and et cetera, and the Democrats, nothing like so coy, definitely in favor of remain, definitely in favor of reversing Brexit, uh, definitely willing to back a second referendum in the hope and expectation that it would come up with a different result, partly for the reasons I've just shown you, 
or indeed in the case of the Liberal Democrats saying, well, if we win this election, that's it. Uh, we know we're just cancelling Brexit uh, uh, forthwith. So you've got a pretty polarised choice. So what happens to the relationship between party support and how people, uh, people's views on Brexit? So this is first of all showing you that how Remain and Leave voters in 2016 divided uh, their support in 2015, first and third column, and then um, what they did in 2019, the second and the fourth column. And you will note there was a marked change, particularly and above all in the case of the Conservative Party. Uh, back in 2015, 45% of Leave voters voted for the Conservatives, but so also did 30% of Remain voters. You saw the division earlier in the party's support in the Brexit referendum. But by the time we get to the 2019 election, 74% of uh, Leave voters are supporting the Conservatives and only 19% Remain voters. In other words, the Conservative Party pivots. It partly happens in 2017, it goes further in 2019, pivots towards and becomes basically Britain's principal Brexit party. And so doing it loses ground amongst Remain voters, but it gains amongst Leave voters. In contrast, uh, well, first of all, then take Liberal Democrats. Liberal Democrats, all of their increase in support, such as it was between 2015 and 2019, occurs amongst Remain voters. The Liberal Democrats, albeit already the most Europhile of Britain's parties, becomes so much more of a Remain party so far as its electoral base is concerned. Meanwhile, Labour, by 2019, has gained some ground amongst Remain voters, but it has lost some ground amongst Leave voters. So its vote, despite the fact that Labour tried to keep both sides of the Brexit divide happy, um, ends up um, uh, pivoting in the Remain direction. There's one other thing, however, crucially I've got to point out to you at this point. And notice that the Leave vote is concentrated in more or less one party. Uh, the re Remain vote in contrast, Remain voters were as, as likely to vote for one of the pro-second referendum parties as Leave voters were to vote for one of the pro-Brexit parties. But in the case of Remain voters, their vote is fragmented. The crucial reason why the Conservatives won the 2019 election with a noble majority is not because they convinced any more voters than they had done previously that they were uh, the, of the merits of leave. Indeed, uh, uh, only 47% of, uh, uh, of the vote was cast for pro-Brexit parties. It was the differential concentration of the leave vote that was crucial. We also see this in the character of support for constituencies. This is now breaking down uh, the level of support for Conservative and Labour according to the level of support for Remain and Leave in the 2016 referendum. And you will notice that the Conservative Party gains ground above all in seats where more than 60% voted Leave, and lose ground amongst uh, constituencies that voted Remain. Uh, in the case of Labour, the pattern's the other way around. And of course, quite a lot of those so-called red wall seats, places in Stoke, in Durham, um, in Cumbria, are places among those seats with a large leave vote in 2016. And the red wall is iconic of that change. But of course, those are also constituencies that uh, are also tend to consist of a lot of working class voters. So what's happened to the class base of British politics? Well, the headline's straightforward. The class base of British politics has pretty much disappeared, at least for the time being. This is now breaking people down according to how the government defines people by social class. So managerial professional is the blue bars. Um, routine and semi-routine workers are the pale blue bars. And as you can see, back in 2015, yes, the Conservative Party, as we would expect, rather more popular amongst those in managerial and professional occupations than in those in working class occupations, and particularly popular amongst uh, those in small business. But by the time we get to 2019, the Conservative Party is actually more popular amongst working class voters than it is amongst those in managerial and professional workers. Indeed, it is now weakest amongst managerial and professional workers 
than it is, I mean, any other occupational group. Meanwhile, compare that with Labour's position. Labour, yes, once clearly much more popular amongst working class voters. That is no longer the case. Labour as popular amongst managerial and professional workers as it is amongst working class voters. And indeed, if you remember the 44% support for the Conservatives amongst working class voters in the previous slide, yes, the Labour Party was not only predominantly, no longer predominantly a working class party, it was no longer the most popular party of the working class. This is a very, very substantial change. Um, and it's a change which again is also reflected in the constituency vote. The Conservative Party has gained ground heavily in the course of the last three elections in constituencies with lots of working class voters. It's lost ground in middle class constituencies for Labour. The pattern is the other way around. So a major disruption to the traditional basis of party support. Not that it isn't differ demographically, it's just that it's no longer social class. It is, as you would guess, age. The Conservative Party has gained ground amongst older voters, lost ground amongst younger voters. The opposite is true of Labour. And yes, it is education. The Labour Party is now uh, the most popular amongst graduates. That is also a dramatic change to our politics. And in a sense, the Labour Party is no longer the party of the working class, it's the party of the working academic. But the, demo the, de the demography of party support now reflects the demography of Brexit because Brexit is now so heavily structuring the pattern of party support. And it also means that the value division, that value division to which I introduced you right at the beginning of this talk, and yes, we're nearly now at the end, um, that value division also now looks different. So this is back to the division between social liberals and social conservatives. And here I've simplified matters by simply showing you, let's just take the orange line. So the 1% in 2001 means that 1% more people amongst social liberals voted Labour than did so amongst social conservatives. In other words, basically social liberals and social conservatives were equally likely to vote Labour. Conservatives in contrast, followed by the blue line, you know, they were doing a little bit less one amongst social liberals than amongst social conservatives, which is what the minus sign means. Notice now, however, how in the case of the conservatives, you know, there is an enormous difference between social liberals and social conservatives and the level of support that they give to the Conservative Party. And Labour support is now also, it's not as structured by the social liberal, social conservative divide as is conservative support, but it is quite heavily structured thereby. And meanwhile, when we now look at the division between left and right, conservative support is now not as structured by the left-right division as it is by the social liberal social conservative division and labor support is at least as divided by left-right as it is by the social liberal social conservative division. So this, so the, the social liberal social conservative division is no longer the second value division of British politics. It is now the principal value division of British politics. Um, so this aspect of our traditional politics has been overturned as well. So um, I won't read through all of this. This is just essentially an up sum of what I have said. Um, but obviously, one of the questions that hangs in the air in the wake of this analysis is, well, what does this portend for the future? Is this a permanent change? in the value and demographic division of British politics, or is it a temporary disruption? Uh, that may be something that you want to discuss in the Q&A, but shall we let, 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 let me, for the time being at least, leave this hanging in the air as the $64,000 question that we now face about British politics.
Well, thank you so much for that, Sir John. I think that was a, a really refreshing glance towards some of the numbers and, and what we can learn from them. And I think that's one of the things that has often been missing in, in a lot of political discussions over the past few years. Um, obviously, as you and many of our audience know, um, populism is something we've been thinking about a lot recently at the Wilberforce Society. And, and it's an obvious connection there between kind of rejection of experts and numbers and things and, mm -hmm. and um, patterns there. Um, so we're now going to move into a Q&A session. We look like we have about 25 minutes for that. So if anybody who has a question and hasn't already sent it into us, just uh, put a message in the chat and we'll come and call on you um, when we can do. And just a reminder that um, we are recording the session. So if you want your video to be on, then just, just know that it will be recorded. Um, but, but in the meantime, um, there's one question that, that I'd like to start mm -hmm. off with. Um, and so you kind of answered a, a lot of their thoughts or, or kind of left them hanging about how permanent the shift will be. Mm -hmm. But one other thing you've been writing about and speaking about quite a lot is um, the possibility of a second Scottish independence record. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder how, how far can lessons be drawn in terms of the way that Brexit has shifted voting patterns um, to a, a possible second referendum as compared with back in 2014. Have similar shifts emerged there? And if so, is that something we need to be bearing in mind? Um, short answer to your question is yes. And indeed, Brexit has been uh, as disruptive of the patterns of support for the parties and for independence as it has been for the Britain-wide story that I've shown you, which was frankly essentially an England and Wales story. Um, but let me come, let me then home in specifically on the question of um, independence. Um, you're probably, I'm guessing, all too young to, you might remember the 2014 Scottish independence referendum, but you probably were too young to take too much notice of it, and you can apologize now if I'm impugning anybody's early interest in politics. Um, but one of the features of the Scottish independence referendum of 2014 was that we had an endless debate um, instigated by the Scottish government, by the UK government, because the SNP's vision of independence since about 1990 has been of independence in Europe. So in other words, Scotland becomes an independent country and it then becomes a member state of the European Union. Um, it, given that position, the UK government argued, uh-uh, trouble is that you will not, Scotland would not be able to be a continuing member of the European Union um, if you were to become independent, you would be forced to leave, and maybe the Spanish will say you can't come back in again, all right? So that was, that was so yeah, therefore, this argument about whether or not Scotland could remain inside the European Union as an independent country was a crucial part of the debate, which of course is one of the reasons why the fact that in the end, then two years later, Scotland votes to remain inside the EU, but then finds itself on the way out is a wee bit of embarrassment for those on the Union side. But anyway, crucially, however, that debate was a complete waste of time. Because what we know is that if you divide people at that point in time to essentially those who were Europhile and those who were Eurosceptic, how they voted, uh, whether they voted yes or no, it differed hardly at all between the two groups. Indeed, if we fast forward to the 2016 Brexit referendum, the level of support for leave amongst those who voted yes two years previously was almost as high as the level of support amongst those who had voted no. So in other words, it cut completely across the independence debate. So, however, thereafter, things change in the wake of Brexit. Um, but for a while, in a way that was subterranean. In other words, what you began to see was, yes, some people who had voted no and remain switch to yes, as the SNP were anticipating. However, they were counterbalanced by other people who had voted yes and leave, who now switched to no. But it begins to mean that attitudes towards Brexit begin to be intertwined with the constitutional debate and people's views on that debate in a way that hitherto 
it had not been. But for, a t for quite a while, doesn't change the overall numbers because the groups moving counterbalance each other. What then begins to emerge in 2019 is that's no longer the case. Not surprising because there are twice as many yet uh, no remain voters as there are yes leave voters. And the polls in 2019 begin to show a rise in support for independence. It gets to 49, 50%. And all of the increase occurs amongst those who had voted remain. Okay. Um, and that does now mean, if I, I, I did this calculation only earlier today, um, which I could do with one poll. So if we now fast forward and look at the situation now, and we divide people not actually to whether they're to whether they vote, we vote, remain or leave, but whether they would vote to rejoin the European Union or to stay out. 71% of those people who say they would vote to rejoin the European Union say they would vote yes in an independence referendum, whereas only 20 odd percent of those people who say they'd vote to stay out of the EU would vote yes. So there's now a very sharp division. And in effect, and you know, this reflects the fact that the choice facing Scotland in any immediate referendum is a very different one in 2014. In 2014, it was independence or not, but both sides, but, but you know, with claims that you could still be inside the European Union, irrespective. The choice is now between independence inside the European Union, given that it seems pretty likely that the Scottish and independent Scotland would vote to rejoin versus uh, outside the UK, sorry, inside the UK, but outside the European Union. That makes it a much more stark choice. So yeah, it's fundamentally changed the, char the, the character of the nationalist coalition. It was disruptive and did actually disadvantageous to the SNP initially, but it's now working to their advantage. Yeah. No, thank you very much for that. Um, so Martin uh, Lucas Smith has, has sent a question in already. And I think a lot of what you're talking about, Sir John, with kind of the shift in support for Conservative and Labour, that, that Martin's question will play in very well in terms of thinking about an alternative. So yeah, over to you, Martin. Thank you, John. It's a very interesting talk. Um, in my view, the first past the post system makes it hard for new parties to gain a foothold in the long term. Um, with the result of a, a continuing two party system as seen in the US also. So would you agree that if the voting system were not so constrained, the current two parties would naturally split into three parties, i.e. Conservatives, Moderates, made up of Tory wets plus sort of very Blairite Labour, and Social Democrats, so Socialists. And would you agree that unless there's voting reform, neither party would be willing to make the first move, as it were, to split off their more centrist wings. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a fascinating question because, you know, one of the things that's also really remarkable about the story that I've told is that whereas in many a, what we used to call West European countries, uh, we've seen quite radical changes in the structure of the party system, not least in the wake of you know, the rise of populism. In the UK, this, div this, this, this division, which cut across the traditional basis of our parties, has end up being, ended up being articulated through the two-party system. So we've kept the two, so we've kept, as it were, the superstructure, even though the foundations have changed. Whereas elsewhere, as the foundations have changed, so also has the superstructure. And it is a fascinating contrast. And it is an interesting question as to whether or not first past the post is responsible for that. It has to be said, of course, if we go back to the spring of 2019, the answer to that question looked to be, well, not necessarily because the Liberal Democrats took off, the Brexit Party took off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, you know, it's an interesting question as the extent to which the logic of the two party system uh, uh, forced it back into Conservative Labour. I think you can certainly argue, for example, that the fact at the end of the end of the day, the Brexit party didn't didn't challenge the Tories in Tory seats and that as a result, probably also dissipated their strength elsewhere. But that was the logic of the single member party system kicking in. Um, and it was also demonstrating the fact that the Conservative Party worked out how to play the single party um, uh, single member uh, 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 priority uh, system, whereas on the other side, you know, 
coordination, the coordination that was required didn't exist. So you still got the fragmentation, all right? Um, so, uh, so yes, I mean, you know, clearly, uh, you know, changing electoral systems doesn't necessarily mean that you will change the structure of a party system, but clearly some of the potential barriers to that, um, given we do have a changed, um, you know, a set of foundations, you know, you know, it may well be true that the single member party system has played a crucial role. I mean, uh, that said, of course, um, I mean, the other thing I should then say straight away, which follows on to my answer to the previous question, the two party system might have survived in England and Wales, it's dead in Scotland. Right. So in the end, the, but of course, that's a, that in part is a consequence of the interaction between a PR system and a Westminster system and a referendum, which again was ended up being deeply disruptive. So it's no one of these things that, that, that's responsible, but it's not proven to be sufficient. And of course, in Northern Ireland, it doesn't result in a two party system. OK. So there are limits to what it can achieve, and it's really only now in England and Wales that you've got a two-party system. But yeah, it's proved remarkably resilient during the course of the last four years, and I would accept that you can argue that the two-party system, sorry, that the single-member electoral system has perhaps played a non-trivial role in that story, though maybe not the only, it's probably not the only character in the, in the drama. Are there any more questions from the floor? Oh, we just just had one one come in from from Matthew. So, should the Lib Dems and Labour cooperate in a Scottish election in order to present a progressive Remainer unionist unionist alternative? <laughs> um, well, that's for them to decide. Um, and I guess, um, uh, well, the difficulty at the moment for both those parties to be blunt is they don't have enough, they don't have enough support. So, you know, the Liberal Democrats are still running at seven, six, seven, eight percent in Scotland. Um, and um, the Labour Party, well, some of the polls may be a bit better, but certainly no more than 20 percent. And most polls would say it's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. So put the two together, 25. And given you've got a PR system, it's not going to make that much difference to the outcome. And I don't think it's going to make it, I, and I'm not sure such a combination would necessarily be particularly more attractive to the electorate you have to win back. I mean, I think the crucial thing to understand here about what's happened is that I think the, the, the SMP have been left the field as the only rejoin party in Scotland. So the Liberal Democrats have said, we're not a rejoin party. The Labour Party voted in favour of the deal. Um, and, you've, and so they've vacated the ground in a country where basically as many people say they would vote to rejoin as they would, as they vote, as voted to remain back in 2016. This is not obviously good electoral politics. And why the Liberal Democrats, frankly, want to say we should rejoin the single market and take up freedom of movement oh but we shouldn't rejoin the european union i mean once you've decided to buy into freedom of movement you've just bought into the thing about the european union that above all is most unpopular and which was the straw that broke the camel's back um, for the remain side in the 2016 referendum once you're willing to sign up to, to freedom of movement you might as well be in favor of remain because you're frankly saying we're in favor of the bits of the European Union that people don't like, but oh, but of course we won't rejoin. It doesn't make sense at all, but you know, presumably they have Anyway, the, the result in the short term is they've just left the field to the SMP. And I think the SMP, you know, I've already told you about how these things are intertwined. So, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, even as a joint operation, the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party are going to pose that much of a threat. And also, I mean, one other thing I can share with you, is that well over seven? I mean, well over seventy percent of those people who voted Labour in 2010 and voted SNP in 2019, and who must be the prime market for any Labour campaign north of the border, over seventy percent of that group voted Remain. So I think they've just put themselves 
politically in the wrong place to offer uh, a significant threat to the SNP, given also, I mean, the, 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 the other problem now, the Unionist Party, and again, this is a fundamental change in the character of politics in Scotland. Back in 2011, the SNP was very heavily reliant uh, for its majority on the support of people who were in favour of devolution but not independence. The point about the referendum promise was to persuade people to vote for the SNP in election because they knew that it wouldn't automatically mean independence. Those days are over. Virtually everybody who currently is in favour of independence, which is now over half the electorate, says they're going to vote for the SNP, and virtually everybody who's looking at saying they're going to vote for the SNP is in favour is, 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 is in favour of independence. So the two have become to the same. So if that remains the case, then basically you're looking at a quasi-referendum. And you know, the Labour Party's hopes of being able to appeal to the party because you know we'll promise you federalism, whatever that means. That boat may already have sailed out of the uh, constitutional harbour. Um, we, we've had two more questions come in, and I think we might just have time to, to squeeze them both in. But, sure. but Martin's asked another question that follows on quite nicely from that, that if um, in a few years' time um, we, we follow a course of history that le leads Scotland to split from the Union, yes. what does that mean for kind of British and, and English politics, particularly <laughs> given the Conservative majority in England and that 57 seats are being taken out of play there? Does that mean that we're looking at a really long-term conservative majority and kind of a, a semi-permanent one-party system, as it were, in, in, in England? Well, uh, I, 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 that is a possible argument. Uh, the argument against you, however, will be twofold. One is that, um, of course, the Labour Party in 97, in 2001, 2005, managed to get a majority of seats at south of the border. The second is, I mean, the Conservative Party will be deeply, deeply riven if indeed the pursuit of Brexit has ended up with Scotland leaving the Union. I mean, and, and how politics in England responds to what will be, you know, if, if the United Kingdom leaving the European Union was a significant blow to the European Union, Scotland leaving the United Kingdom is one hell of a blow, uh, would be one hell of a blow to the stature and standing and self-confidence um, of England. Um, uh, the fallout from which I think is very, very difficult uh, to forecast, but it doesn't mean that I think that the Conservative Party can contemplate an independent Scotland with any degree of um, equanimity. Um, so just just one more question. Um, I mean, one of the other regional um, disparities that have shown up and regional trends over the past couple of years um, has been the, the north-south divide, and particularly yep. the Red Wall um, yep. collapsing in 2019. Um, and Alex has asked whether you think that Brexit is kind of symptomatic of a, of a wider shift or whether that's been the key driver in this in this collapse. Well, I, I think there's two parts to that. I mean, it, it, it's pretty clear from you know, other research I've done, which didn't talk about this, this evening, um, that the loss of Labour support in um, what we now can call Labour leave seats, and most of which are in the so-called Red Wall, they're north of Birmingham, and they're, they're places that Labour has, have not lost if, for a long time, if ever. Um, the, the movement from 2015 to 2019 is essentially uh, a consequence of Brexit. Um, and essentially Labour's problem is, I mean, you know, actually even in um, seats that voted Labour in 2017, um, uh, but voted Leave in 2016, a majority of the Labour vote is still a Remain vote, okay? But a bigger proportion of the Labour vote is a Leave vote in these Labour Leave constituencies than it was in, for example, somewhere like Islington. Um, and because Labour was indeed losing ground heavily amongst those of its Leave supporters who were still voting for it in 2017, and I've shown you some of the data on that, uh, then it was losing ground, particularly its constituencies. But everything that we've looked at suggests it's an 
It's to do with the fact that Labour was more reliant on Leave voters in these constituencies. And of course, these Leave voters are more likely to be working class voters for the reasons I've explained, um, uh, et cetera, that certainly therefore the loss of the, the, the Brexit is certainly the straw that broke the camel's back. That said, what is true is that Labour was losing ground in some of these seats, particularly from kind of 2005 onwards. And therefore, probably, and, and, and one other thing that we know is that, you know, one of the consequences of new Labour is that significant, I mean, the electorate stopped thinking of the Labour Party as a working class party. So Labour might think of itself as being a working class party, but of course, you know, under Tony Blair, the aim very much was to appeal to socially liberal middle class people. All right, Jeremy Corbyn achieved what Tony Blair was trying to achieve when he was leader of the Labour Party by getting all of these uh, middle class graduates uh, to vote, to young graduates to vote for it. Um, and certainly, you know, there's quite a lot of research evidence that says not necessarily that working class Labour voters were switching over to the Tories. That seems to be a post Brexit phenomenon. They were just staying at home. So you can see in some of these constituencies a longer term trend of Labour's vote going down. So it therefore probably is a story where Tony Blair loosened the foundation stones and then Brexit together with Jeremy Corbyn's inability to keep his party's coalition together uh, ensured that the pillars fell down. But perhaps both the left and the right of the Labour Party have, uh, are culpable for uh, some of the losses that the Labour Party has lost uh, in the uh, Red Wall seats. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. Um, my own constituency is Bolton West, and it went oh, slightly yes. before 2016 for the first time in, in generations. So that's sure. really interesting. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So thank you very much for those questions and for those answers, Sir John. And, and thank you again for the presentation. And I'll just hand over to, to George for a few closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And thank you very much, Sir John, for your really fascinating insights. It's been a complete pleasure to listen to you this evening, and we're really very grateful to you for coming along and taking the time to talk to us. Um, and thank you also to everyone who's come along to listen. We hope you found the talk from Sir John as interesting as we have. If you did enjoy, please do consider signing up for a membership of the Wilberforce Society, the details of which are on our website and our Facebook page. You're also warmly invited to join us for our upcoming annual conference on Saturday the 13th of February, where we'll be continuing to explore many of the themes that have been discussed tonight, and we'll be focusing there particularly on populism, with an exciting programme of speakers from the worlds of politics, academia and business. Um, details again are on our social media platforms and our website, along with a link to register for that in advance. So thanks once again to Sir John and to everyone who's asked questions and got involved in the discussion today. And we hope you all have a really lovely evening. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much for the invitation.